Custom water cooling can be a lot of things if you let it. It can be fun or frustrating. It could be simple or complex. And of course, it can be risky or rewarding. I've done quite a few custom water cooled builds for the channel and often people ask me the same questions in the comment sections or on Twitter. So what I've decided to do is put together a guide for those of you who want to dip your toes into the pond but who aren't quite sure where to start. This is Water Cooling for Beginners, part one. I hope you enjoy this video and find it at least moderately educational. If so, please toss me a like down below and get subscribed so you don't miss subsequent videos in this series. Also, consider supporting me by visiting my new Patreon or the merchandise store, link down below. So, just to get some things out of the way right off the bat. This video series is not sponsored by, nor was it the idea of Thermaltake. However, when their M360 Plus RGB kit arrived at the office, I thought it would be a great jumping off point as it does have everything you reasonably need to get going. When I pitched the idea to them, they were more than happy to provide other parts to use as examples. So that's why you'll probably see a lot of Thermaltake things on this table, including a Thermaltake chassis, power supply, and other assorted fittings. I wanna say thank you to Thermaltake for their support, and you can find links to all this stuff down below in the video description. Also, you see that we're going to be building in an open air enclosure. This was a conscious decision to allow for better visibility of exactly what's going on in our loop and how we achieve our goals. Most people, of course, will be building inside of a proper case, and that presents a couple of additional hurdles, but the basic principles that we talk about here should apply universally. So to my left, you see our completed build. But don't worry, I'm not just gonna snap my fingers and show you short clips of how we got here. I'm actually gonna be breaking down this system and rebuilding it for you step by step. So part one of this video series will focus on the parts. What loop components do you actually need to purchase in order to build a functional system? Let's start with a pump and reservoir. Often you could find pump res combos, like this one or that one, and for beginners this is probably the best way to go as it eliminates having to purchase a pump and reservoir separately, find a way to mate them, and then hope that everything works correctly without any leaks. Now technically, you do not need a reservoir in a water cooling system. However, they do provide several very real benefits. First. They look damn cool. And if you have some RGB effects as we do over here, or if you have colored coolant inside, they can really add some visual flair to your build. However, perhaps their more important function is to provide an easy way to fill and drain your loop, as well as monitor coolant levels in the system. You can get reservoirs with many different configurations, including a large cylinder like this, a bay mount that sits in a five and a quarter inch drive space, or smaller pieces like cubes or hexagons. Make sure that the reservoir you choose has enough ports to support your planned build. Some come with a solid top and no ports, and some come with up to four. This one has one. Some of them face forwards, backwards, and straight up. You can also likely find a replacement top with a different port configuration from your reservoir manufacturer available on sites like Performance PCs or Mod My Mods. Below the reservoir, in both of our examples, we see the pump unit. This over here is a D5 pump, but don't fret over D5 versus DDC, as they're functionally very similar. Either will do just fine in a PC loop and shouldn't have any problem pushing coolant through the system. The difference boils down to flow rate versus head pressure, as DDC pumps have more pressure while D5s typically have a higher flow rate. Think of it like a car engine and horsepower versus torque. A high horsepower engine with a moderate amount of torque may end up being very fast, but would be terrible at towing a boat trailer. While a truck with a decent amount of horsepower, but a huge amount of torque will have no problem ripping out a tree stump but would get embarrassed in a street race. Although this description seems very stark, in reality when it comes to D5 versus DDC, a water cooling loop doesn't provide nearly enough obstacles 
where you'll see a huge difference between the two. And if you're just starting out, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Your pump will typically have two ports on it, an input and an output. Although this unit over here relies on the input from the reservoir as it's one connected unit. Make sure you take note of which port is in and which port is out, as it's important in figuring out your loop order later on. Moving over to blocks. This is where the heat generating parts of your system make contact with the loop and exchange heat. You can get blocks for your CPU, your GPU, your VRMs, your memory, and now you can even get them for M.2 SSDs, add-on cards, and even power supplies. Again though, we're gonna keep it basic for now. Our loop only has one block in it, and that's for the CPU. All the blocks serve the same function, to make physical contact with something that's hot, allow the heat to be transferred through a highly conductive metal surface, usually copper or nickel-plated copper, and dissipated by coolant running through microchannels on the other side. The coolant then carries the heat away from the source. You can buy blocks to fit any CPU socket type, and this one from Thermaltake fits all modern Intel and AMD sockets with the exception of Threadripper. Again, take note of the input and output ports on the block, as if you reverse the flow, you hinder cooling performance by a non-insignificant amount, sometimes by up to 10 degrees. This is because of the microfins that I mentioned earlier, which are machined precisely to facilitate flow in one specific direction. So now that we've got this heat transferred to our coolant, how does it get out of our system? Well, similar to how a car operates, PC cooling loops use radiators. You've probably seen radiators if you've been around the PC scene for any length of time, as they're attached to every AIO cooler on the market. Radiators come in many different varieties, but the most important thing to know is what the size of your available mounting space is, as well as how big the fans are that you plan to use. This unit attached to our system right now is a 360, meaning it uses three 120 millimeter fans. 140 millimeter fans will not fit on here. The mounting holes are not spaced for it. Similarly, if you buy a 280 mil radiator, don't expect to use 120 millimeter fans on it as it's made for two 140s instead. The most common sizes for custom loops are 240 and 360, which use 120 millimeter fans, and 280 and 420, which use 140 millimeter fans. Of course, you can also get single fan units if you want. Another thing to keep in mind is thickness. This radiator mounted over here is a 64 millimeter thick monster, which could be a problem in smaller cases as you run into interference with either GPU length at the front or memory modules at the top. Know your maximum radiator clearance before you buy. And don't forget that in most cases, you'll need to add 25 millimeters to the thickness of your radiator for fans. If you intend to do push-pull, where you have fans on both sides of the radiator, you'll need to add 50 millimeters instead. I tend to prefer 30 or 45 mil rads as they offer a really good balance of cooling capacity and space savings. You'll also see something called FPI on the spec sheet of radiators, or fins per inch. The higher the FPI, the more dense the radiator fins are, and the harder it will be to push air through them. This doesn't mean you should automatically choose the lowest FPI, because the more fins there are, the more surface area is available, and the more contact points the coolant will have with fresh air. Again, I tend to lean towards an FPI rating somewhere in the middle, usually, usually around 18 or 19 fins per inch. Mounted to our radiator over here are our three 120 millimeter fans, which constantly supply the cooling surface with fresh air. Fans are certainly a matter of personal preference, as they tend to look very different depending on which brand you go with. While almost any fan will work with a radiator, the more dense the radiator fins are, the more you'll need to pay attention to something called static pressure. This is similar to our car and truck analogy earlier, as a high static pressure fan might not move air as quickly, but it does so with more force and is able to push across a dense fin array. Be forewarned that fans with high static pressure like the EK Vardar, Noctua NFF12, and Be Quiet Silent Wings often are pretty spendy and don't always come with the flashy RGB features you might want. These Thermaltake Ring Plus, Corsair's ML120 RGB, and Enermax's TB RGB 
are a nice compromise, which should give you good cooling performance and also look pretty good as well. Now, of course, you're gonna need some tubing or else the coolant will just kind of go spurting out all over our system components and nobody wants that. Tubing comes in two main flavors, hard and soft. We'll get into this in a little more detail in another video, which I will dedicate to tubing. But pretty early on in the process, you'll need to decide on if you want hard tubing or soft, as it will inform your decision on which fittings you'll need to buy. Now, with soft tubing, you need to know both the inner diameter and the outer diameter, often expressed like 10 slash 13 or 12 slash 16. This is the inner slash outer diameter measured in millimeters. And your soft tube compression fittings will need to reflect the same measurements in order to properly seal. For hard tubing, the only measurement you need to know is the exterior diameter. So for example, this and this are 16 millimeter hard tube. So you'll need a 16 millimeter hard tube compression fitting. For hard tube fittings, there is no inner barb. So the interior diameter doesn't matter. This brings us to the most difficult, complex and confusing part of what do I buy to get started? And that's fittings. There are so many different fittings serving so many different purposes and coming in so many different angles and colors that I still don't always know what I might need for a build. I've collected some of the most popular here to show you guys, but before you go ahead and place that order, keep three things in mind. First, know what your basic loop layout will be ahead of time. This will allow you to map out in your head where you'll need which fittings and create an inventory of what you'll need. Second, as a rule of thumb, you need at minimum two fittings per cooling component. So if your loop consists of a pump res combo, two radiators, a CPU block and a GPU block, the very minimum you'll need is 10 fittings. This doesn't include things like 90 degree adapters, drain valves, plugs or extenders. And third, always order extras. You will need them. It's just how things work. If you run your calculations and you think you'll need four 90 degree adapters, order five or six. Inevitably, things might not go exactly as planned, or you might decide when running your tubing that it might look better or be a little bit easier if you incorporated another 90 here or there. Maybe that bend you made doesn't look quite level and you need a 10 millimeter extender underneath the compression fitting to make it work. I can't say how many times I've put a loop together and been 98% of the way done only to have to order two more fittings and wait four days for them to be delivered. With those rules out of the way, let's take a look at our fittings. Of course, we have our hard and soft tube compression fittings required for any build. Note the interior barb on the soft tube fitting and the numerous O-rings in the hard tube fitting. These are the mechanisms which create the seal and prevent leaks. These are angled adapters, both 45 and 90 degrees. You can use these in situations like this or this, where it's easier and cleaner than making an additional bend. Plus, sometimes it's impossible to create that tight of a bend radius and a 90 degree fitting is the only way to make it work. This is an extension and you can get them in eight millimeters all the way up to 30 millimeters or you can even get adjustable ones that go even longer. Drain valves are essential, and even though I didn't build one into this system, I never make a permanent build without one. They give you an easy way to drain your loop for maintenance, or if something goes wrong. You also have splitter blocks, uh, two by 45s, plugs, and Y adapters. And we're just really scratching the surface here. Although, if you're a beginner, these are probably the fittings you'll need to be most concerned about. All right, so we've got our pump, our reservoir, our block, our fittings, our tubing, and our radiator. I think we're ready to go. In part two, we'll talk about calculating loop capacity and loop planning. As always, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.